Good morning, Pioneer Drive. It is great to be with you. I hope you had a, a great Thanksgiving. We had a good time uh, down in Spring, the Houston area, with my family, also in, in also in San Angelo, uh, celebrating the 90th birthday of Elia's grandmother. We were honored to be able to celebrate that yesterday uh, with her. Uh, a good time. If you haven't been to Houston in November, that is like the time to go. There's like three days where it's nice in the Houston area. And uh, it was like 72 degrees. It was not a bad time. But we're glad to be back here in Abilene. Our eyes are, as Jeff mentioned earlier in our service, our eyes are now headed towards Christmas. We're beginning our season uh, called Advent. Advent is a Latin word. It means a, a coming or arrival. And uh, it's a season usually celebrated the uh, four Sundays leading up uh, to Christmas. It's a season of preparation. Now you may wonder, well, where did Advent come from? And uh, when did Baptists start celebrating Advent? Well, it's a really good question. Somewhere around the fourth or fifth century, so a long, 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 long time ago, the church began uh, preparing for Christmas and have a season of Advent. Well, during the Protestant Reformation, uh, many Protestants uh, out of that uh, kind of took away, went away from following the church calendar, and Advent was one of those things that was uh, brushed aside. Well, beginning mid-20th century or so, uh, Baptists picked it back up. Some Baptists began picking it back up uh, and, and starting to celebrate and, and taking the good and, and the theologically sound uh, parts of Advent uh, that we can, uh, we can prepare ourselves for Christmas. It's a season of waiting. It's a season of anticipation. It's a time to put ourselves back with Israel in uh, that first century, the, the centuries leading up to the birth of Christ as they were awaiting a Messiah. It's a season to focus on Jesus and a preparation for the arrival of a king. Not material things, not shopping lists, not holiday travel plans, but to focus on Jesus. And so during Advent, we don't arrive, but we prepare. We prepare for an arrival. Last week, when we were setting up Christmas lights at our house, uh, and we were putting them all out there. I said, why, I asked our children, why are we, why are we doing this? And, uh, you know, so Santa Claus can have a place to land or something like that. I said, no, 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 that's not why we're doing this. Uh, it's, it was a way, it's a way of preparing for the arrival of a king. And so we're going to have an intentional time. Advent is an intentional time for us to prepare our hearts for the arrival of Jesus. Do you like waiting? I don't like waiting. <laughs> Ask anybody who knows me. I do not like waiting. Maybe you have found yourself waiting for a, a letter to arrive in, a, in the mail, a, a text message to come in, a family member at the airport, a, a doctor's report to be returned. How do we wait? How do we wait? Because waiting is an important part of our spiritual formation, being molded into the likeness of Christ means we've got to learn how to wait and to wait well. And so Advent is a season for us to recall that Jesus did come and to be among us. And it's that season when we are mindful that God kept his promises and that peace, hope, love, and joy came and took on flesh and bone in Jesus Christ. And so this Advent season at Pioneer Drive, we have themed it the character's of Christmas. And each week during Advent, uh, there's typically a wreath. The green uh, symbolizes the evergreen, the everlasting nature of God's love, the circular nature of God's love, the unending nature of God's love. And each week we light a candle. And this morning we light the candle of hope. And we're going to see how Isaiah teaches us to wait with hope. Because as we are mindful of uh, the early Jewish people who are waiting on a Messiah for Jesus to come, we're also waiting on Christ's second advent, his second coming, that we believe Jesus is, is really going to come back. And, and we are also a people waiting uh, today. So long before there was Mary, long before there was Joseph, long before there were angels visiting shepherds, long before Herod had taken up the throne, long before that storied silent night, there was a longing and there was a hope. Israel was starting to run out of hope. In fact, Israel was in need of hope. And Isaiah was a prophet during this time in Jerusalem, southern Judah. And Isaiah spoke to Judah, to Jerusalem, 
the southern kingdom of Israel's leaders, roughly 740 to 700 BC, as we think about who was this prophet Isaiah. He, he charged them with rebellion against God's covenant. He warned them uh, that to the people of Israel that their rebellion against God would come with a cost, that Assyria and Babylon would come in and conquer them if they continued in their idolatry. He was convinced that the northern kingdom of Israel was done for, but he hoped that the southern kingdom of Judah and, and the family lineage of David would uh, be faithful to the Lord. And so if you go to read the entire book of Isaiah, which I would encourage you to do. It's a great, wonderful book that prepares us for what God is going to do later. Uh, but you would see some of the challenges that were going on in Isaiah's day. In chapter 1, you see they're guilty of evil and abandoning the Lord. They turned their back on God. They weren't doing justice. They weren't defending the oppressed. They weren't taking up the cause of the fatherless and the widow. Israel was in trouble they had rejected the Lord. They had been participating in evil. And so Isaiah comes along and he has to, at first, give a pretty unpopular message. Messages of doom and destruction are not usually received very well. But that was Isaiah's task. He told them of judgment that would come through a purifying fire, that the old Jerusalem would be gone, that Israel would be chopped down like a tree in the field. It would be scorched and burned. Seemed pretty hopeless. To be honest, things weren't going well in Israel. Societal unrest, societal unrighteousness, the forecast wasn't, was not good. Doom, gloom, despair, discouragement, defeat. Little hope. You know what it's like to be without hope? You ever found yourself hopeless? I want you to think for a minute about a situation. Maybe it's past. Maybe it's present. Where you saw little hope. You've been there, right? I've been there. And sometimes, let's just be honest, we're kind of responsible for getting ourselves in that mess. We dug the hole. <laughs> That's where Israel was. They dug the hole. <laughs> maybe it was your sin. Maybe, maybe it was somebody else. Maybe it's just the evil that exists in the world. But, but I want you to think about that situation. And, and when you saw the future from that vantage point, remembering where you were, and maybe you don't have to imagine too much because it's where you are right now, but when you saw the future, what did you see? Did you see separation? Did you start to imagine selling your home, moving your family, losing your job? Did you start to wonder if anybody would ever hire you again? Hopeless. We can look at our world and certainly see reasons for despair, doom, and gloom, right? Wars, division, poverty, inflation, cancer, Racism, death, sin. Israel was in need of hope. Let's stand as we read Isaiah chapter 9, beginning in verse 6. To us, a child is born. To us, a son is given. And the government will be on his shoulders. And he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the greatness of his government and peace, there will be no end. He will reign on David's throne and over his kingdom, establishing and upholding it with justice and righteousness from that time on and forever. The zeal of the Lord Almighty 
will accomplish this. Thank you. You may be seated. You know, Isaiah, he might as well have posted a a job opening, a help wanted sign. (laughs) Help wanted, Messiah needed. Israel's options for hope were running short. He said a king was coming. A a king was coming from the line of David. He, He looked forward to a king who would be like David and have radical faith to save Israel from the Assyrian threat. Here they are looking for a king with some pretty exalted titles. Titles like Mighty God, Eternal Father, Prince of Peace. When this king arrived, this king would be the embodiment of power and presence in the God of Israel. Help wanted, Messiah needed. Isaiah comes and prophesies, predicts, foretells that a king would lead them out of their despair and into victory. That that king would lead them the people of Israel, to be faithful to the covenant, to uphold justice and righteousness, and that they would be a blessing to the nations, that the people walking in darkness would see a great light, that a child would be born, a son would be given, that the government would be on his shoulders, and he would reign on David's throne forever. Isaiah foretold that the people of Israel would need a messianic savior. They could not save themselves. And so in chapter 11, Isaiah says this, a a shoot will come up from the stump of Jesse and from his roots a branch will bear fruit. The spirit of the Lord will rest on him, the spirit of wisdom and of understanding the spirit of counsel and of might, the spirit of the knowledge and fear of the Lord. Now, who was Jesse? Jesse was King David's father. And you see here in Isaiah's prophecy the longing for a new king, a king to lead, a king to do what is right, to rule justly, to lead Israel in faithful obedience to God's covenant. No matter how hopeless things seemed in Israel, there is this promise. There is this promise that a new David would grow out of Jesse's line. Now, there was a near-term immediate fulfillment that briefly happened under the reign of King Hezekiah. You can read about that in chapters 26 to 38 of the book of Isaiah, he he came up and he uh, presented hope to the people of Israel that, that he would be a better king, but Hezekiah too eventually fell. He was disqualified by his selfishness and sin. Babylon comes, attacks, Israel is taken into exile, and all the things that Isaiah prophesied came to pass. So in chapter 40, we read from Isaiah, why do you complain, Jacob? Why do you say, Israel, my way is hidden from the Lord. My cause is disregarded by my God. You ever felt that way? Do you not know? Have you not heard? The Lord is the everlasting God, the creator of the ends of the earth. He will not grow tired or weary, and his understanding no one can fathom. He gives strength to the weary and increases the power of the weak. Even youths grow tired and weary, and young men stumble and fall. But those who hope in the Lord will renew their strength. They will soar on wings like eagles. They will run and not grow weary. They will walk and not be faint. As Israel has been in exile, they are suffering the consequences of their own sin. Sometimes when we're helpless, we start to think, we, we look for blaming other people. And sometimes other people are responsible for that. But one of the things I try to challenge myself and those around me is we got to own our part of the problem. 
we got to own our part of the problem. And Israel had not been faithful to the Lord, and they were suffering those consequences. But the question becomes, where, where do you look for hope? But where do you look for hope? Because at this point, it, these people who were in many ways hopeless, <laughs> they were weary. God comes into that situation. God steps into that situation and promises hope and promises help. God comes in and promises hope, and God comes in and promises help. God renews the strength of those who hope in the Lord. We learn some things, a lot of things from Isaiah's work and ministry, one of which God hears your hopelessness. God hears your complaints. God knows your tears. God knows your sorrows. He knows what's keeping you up at night. God knows your history. He sees the despair, the discouragement, the disappointment, and the distance and the defeat that marks our lives. God sees all of that. God does not ignore that trouble. This is a message for those who are waiting on God's rescue, that God is our hope in our helplessness, that the Lord is the everlasting God, the creator of the ends of the earth. He does not grow tired or weary. He is the one who gives strength in our weight and in our hope, that Isaiah promises us, tells of a God that does not ignore us in our trouble, that God sees our hopeless situation and that God promises to renew the strength of his people. But God is our hope. Our hope is not the stock market. Our hope is not politics. Our hope is not a perfect life of leisure and everything going according to our plan. It is God who is our hope. Because hope is a sense of expectation and desire For a certain thing to happen. With hope there is this sense of anticipation and trust that something is going to happen. But but to point out hope in times of despair, some folks are going to think you're crazy. How is a new branch going to come off this stump that seems cut off and completely broken? People, You start talking about hope and people start thinking you're crazy. Have you not seen the headlines? Have you not seen reality? How in the world is God's work going to come busting forth in this moment? But what hope tells us is that difficult chapters are not defining chapters. Just like a seed that gets planted beneath the soil. Hope believes that promise of what will be. may be small. It may be unassuming, but hope can transcend even the bleakest of circumstances in times of sorrow, in times of defeat, in times of discouragement. We cling to hope because all throughout as Israel is disobedient and unfaithful, Isaiah keeps planting this seed in their minds and in their hearts that something better is coming, that help is coming. And in chapter 53, as Terrence read earlier, I'll just read the verses uh, one through five of chapter 53. He grew up before him like a tender shoot and like a root out of dry ground. He had no beauty or majesty to attract us to him, nothing in his appearance that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected by mankind, a man of suffering and familiar with pain. Like one from whom people hide their faces, he was despised and he was held in low esteem. Surely, he took up our pain and bore our suffering, yet we considered him punished by God, stricken by him and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was on him. And by his wounds, by his wounds, we are healed. As we read this, it sounds like we're reading from the New Testament, doesn't it? It Sounds like we're reading from the New Testament, but you're reading 
the book of Isaiah. Because here's the truth. None of David's descendants lived up to this. None of David's descendants lived up to this call. Isaiah, though, was a prophet that pointed beyond his day. He was a prophet that pointed beyond his day. That no matter how bad things got, God promised that a new David would grow out of Jesse's line. It was a message for those waiting on God's rescue from violence, God's rescue from oppression, God's kingdom of justice and and, and peace was coming, that a new servant would come to restore Israel to be a light to the nations. This is the story, and this is the reality, and this was the prophecy that Jesus was born into. The New Testament teaches us that the people of Israel would wait a long time 700 years, think about 700 years ago. That's a long time ago, long before anybody had ever dreamed of the United States of America. 700 years ago, it took a long time for this prophecy to be fulfilled. But God would answer hope. God would answer hope. Jesus would be born into this line. But to truly appreciate Jesus' arrival, we have to understand how long the people of Israel had been waiting, how long they had been hoping. He was the one, Jesus being the one, that the story was pointing to all along. So how does Isaiah fit into the Christmas story? Characters of Christmas, pastor, and now we're 700 years before Christmas. How does this fit together? Well, The book of Isaiah, the prophet Isaiah, alongside the Psalms, two of the most quoted Old Testament books by Jesus, as well as the apostles. His his longings that we see in Isaiah, hopes and promises paved the way for Israel to be ready for and to understand the Messiah and Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus the Christ. Matthew would quote Isaiah chapter 7, verse 14, and Matthew 1, 22 and 23. All this, talking about the Christmas narrative, took place to fulfill what the Lord had said through the prophet, the virgin will conceive and give birth to a son, and they will call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. When Jesus arrived, he started doing things that made people realize this is what God has been up to all along. This is what God's been getting us ready for. His life, his ministry was the fulfillment of everything that they had been foretold so long ago. Those ancient prophecies that hung the help wanted, Messiah needed sign, were fulfilled when Jesus arrived successfully to bring that hope and to bring that help. You know, the thing about faith and hope The writer of Hebrews gives us a pretty good definition of faith, and it's closely related to hope. It says, now now faith is confidence in what we hope for and assurance about what we do not see. Faith is a confidence in what we hope for, but by definition, by definition, It is four seasons when we do not see in full. Paul would say to the church at Corinth, this side of heaven, it's like seeing through a glass dimly. It's like seeing through a foggy mirror. We don't have all the answers. You ever looked at a situation in life? This just seems a bit foggy. It's not very clear to me. I'm not sure what the future looks like. Maybe there are some things in your life right now that just seem a bit foggy. You know, faith and fear require us to believe something about the future that hasn't happened yet. Have you thought about that? Some of us like to worry a lot. Uh, Some of us are great at faith, (laughs) and I applaud you, I learn from you. 
But faith, fear, and worry all require us to believe something about the future that hasn't happened yet. And what hope tells us is to look to the future with faithful anticipation that Jesus is our hope, that Jesus is our help, and that God will be with us to meet us in that future and to be our help and to be our hope. (coughs) Excuse me. The ground where despair and defeat unfolds is often the fertile soil with which hope arises. The ground where despair and defeat unfolds is often the fertile soil with which hope arises. You see these promises of hope that Isaiah was giving to the people of Israel. It'd be a long time before they were fulfilled. They would have to wait. And amidst the waiting, they were given hope. When we wait, God gives us hope. Not cynicism, not despair, not discouragement, and not defeat. Because hope is most persuasive, church, when it is most tested. Hope is most persuasive, church, when it is most fragile. Hope is where we cling in times of hurt. Hope is where we cling in our heartache. Hope is where we cling in our desperation. That God takes disappointed, disgraced, depressed, disillusioned, dejected, distanced, and defeated people, and the promise of Scripture is that he's going to turn their mourning into dancing, that dead ends and detours are not final disasters in the kingdom of God. Because the hope we celebrate at Christmas is not that our God guarantees a life of bliss and perfection, but that in all seasons, in all trials, in all circumstances, God is with us. Emmanuel, that God has come near in our helplessness, in our hopelessness, God has come near. And that is enough to get us up out of the bed in the morning and to put one shoe on and to put the other shoe on and to live our days faithfully walking in his steps. Because one day Jesus will return. It'll be the final advent. And we'll no longer speak of hope. Hope will become reality. Faith will be sight. So here's some questions for us to give some thought to this week. What does God's promise say about your hopeless situation? How can you wait actively? Waiting is not something we do passively, um, but actively. And then how, this Christmas season, will you point others to a hope beyond our day? People need hope. They're searching. And they're going to try to find it in the perfect presence and buying up stuff and being invited to all the parties and all the events and filling up their calendars and nostalgia. It's all great, fine. But it's not the hope of our Lord Jesus Christ because that stuff's all temporal. You know, Advent, this season, you know this. Maybe you're living this. It can be a difficult time, can it? Maybe things just aren't very merry for you right now. Maybe a diagnosis, a condition, a divorce, tragedy, illness, broken relationships, strained finances, health challenges, personal concerns. But Isaiah helps us this Advent season set the stage for us to look for a hope that's beyond ourselves, a hope that's beyond the headlines of our day, a hope that's beyond the circumstances of our day. And it gets us ready for a hope that was found in Bethlehem, a God who has come near to bring us hope, a God who didn't remain in the heavens but came crashing into earth to be with his people, to redeem his people, to save his people. Isaiah teaches us to wait with hope. 
that the ground where despair and defeat unfolds is often the fertile soil with which hope arises. God has come near and God is our hope and our helplessness. Let us pray. Father, I pray this morning for those of us that may find ourselves in need of some hope today. Whatever has come our way in life, maybe today, this morning, this week, just find ourselves a bit down, a bit discouraged, maybe a lot discouraged, a lot down. Father, I pray that you would help us to cling to hope in our waiting. Help us, Lord, to be good waiters. Sow those seeds of patience in us and confident expectation, Father, that you're going to do what you say you're going to do. And though the world around us gives way, though the nations are in uproar, your word stands, and it stands secure. And we can rest and go to bed at night knowing that you have us in your hands. So, Lord, help us to hope in a way that honors you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.